All right, uh, welcome to uh, today's uh, Exchange Lab session. Um, I hope you're having a good day. My name is Abel Mirales. I'm one of the founders of the Jazz Exchange. Um, you're seeing this uh, either through Facebook, uh, or through our page at the Jazz Exchange, um, or you can also check this out on our YouTube channel. So uh, for those uh, that are tuning in for the first time, uh, the Jazz Exchange uh, is an organization based uh, in the New York City area. And the Exchange Lab sessions are this space that we started uh, uh, basically since the pandemics uh, began in, in, uh, uh, in, in an effort to create community uh, over the Internet and, uh, you know, and, and, and hopefully more than that, where we bring in uh, amazing musicians and we share to you their music and their and, and their new uh, productions that they're coming out with, you know, or even previous stuff, you know, it's been such a wonderful time for us to actually, uh, you know, be able to talk and get uh, get to know personally some of these amazing musicians that we have through the sessions and to get to hear their music. Uh, today we have a very special guest. Um, he's a, an amazing uh, uh, trumpet player. He's an inspiration and and uh, we, we're so honored that he decided he, you know, he made some time in his schedule to to come and talk to us for a bit. Before I do that, I'd like to talk to you guys about some of the programs that we have at the Jazz Exchange. I want to start first with uh, uh, letting you know uh, all our social uh, handle for uh, for social media, our website and everything is right there on your screen. Um, if you want to find out more about the different programs that we have, especially uh, you know, the interviews that we're conducting um, every week. Uh, please uh, go to our website, go to our Facebook. Uh, you know, as you can see, our Instagram is right there too, is at the underscore jazz underscore exchange. Or you could go to you, uh, Facebook to at the jazz exchange dot org or even our YouTube channel. Uh, YouTube channel is pretty interesting because we're posting all our exchange past the uh, exchange live sessions there so if you miss one of them uh, live you can go back and and check it out and and really just get to we really get to the point of like this is what this is artist is about and this is the music that that they have for you so also the the next program i'd like to you, talk to you about or the first program um is uh our education program so uh, as you all know, we, we always like to talk about this because we're so proud of it. In every single session that we do, we talk about this educational program where we're basically working with uh, Jazz House Kids uh, based in Montclair, New Jersey, and uh, also with Grupo Esmart from uh, Juarez in Mexico. And they sponsor us a couple, you know, they've actually, for the past two years, they've, they were able to uh, sponsor a couple, uh, several kids to come all the way out here and spend a couple of weeks and study with some of the teachers and the you know the faculty uh, of jazz house kids and some of the you know the best musicians around the world so they get this uh, amazing experience where they can they can also see uh and and you know meet uh some of their peers that are really pushing with this music and so we're very happy that we're able to do that uh and we want to continue to do that so so if you want to join the effort uh you know r reach out to us let us know that you want to help or sponsor one of these kids and we would love to uh, you know help you with that as well so uh, so far we're so happy that uh, uh, even a couple of the students uh, are going to college for uh, for jazz uh, out here in New York uh, a couple of students from El Paso Texas after going to the program uh, they decided to apply and luckily they were accepted they I think, believe they're doing a lot of virtual stuff like we all doing nowadays so that's one amazing program that we want to continue. So uh, make sure to reach out to us if you want to join us. Uh, we also have still our our um, Jazz Exchange uh, Relief Fund, the Jazz Exchange Relief Fund that you can find in GoFundMe. Uh, basically, we started this uh, also since the pandemic, collecting money basically to to be able to assist the musicians with uh, with a little bit of, of, of financial help and also you know collaborating with them through our virtual jazz sessions, uh, which are basically videos that we put together um, and everybody records remotely from home and all that. So doing a lot of things, you know, instead of, uh, um, you know, just uh, watching TV all day. <laughs> 
we just stare at the computer all day making some work. So, so uh, we're very happy that we a- we've been able to uh, distribute funds already for musicians. Uh, we are uh, preparing to collaborate with some of them and distribute the funds that way and doing some productions. Um, so, if you want to help uh, uh, with that, please by all means. Uh, I believe right now GoFundMe is processing our. Our campaign and it should be up in a couple of days. But uh, if you want to donate now, you can just go to the jazzexchange.org and you'll see the donation button there for PayPal. Um, and uh, or send shoot us an email. You know, uh, we'd we'll be more than happy. Um, really quickly before I introduce my guest tonight, uh, we do uh, we had a couple of weeks ago actually a secret show. So we'll you know uh, it was a virtual show. We're trying to see if we can do do more of this secret shows. Basically, we had uh, the amazing uh, Jerome Jennings and his uh, and his quintet. Uh, they came down and they we actually um, got you to uh, it, we introduced you to the National Jazz Museum in Harlem because that's what we were actually doing the live stream. It was a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, uh, eventually we, we we're gonna submit a, to our YouTube channel a couple of this edited videos so you can check out how how it was and so you don't miss the next secret show, man. Because it's like like we mentioned before, this is a whole thing of uh, you know uh, getting to n- n- introduce yourself to uh, some of the new artists and discover new venues and meet new people. So any, anyways, without further ado, I'd like to introduce this. This gentleman, like I mentioned, he is an amazing uh, musician. Um, he is an amazing composer, educator, and a great inspiration for uh, a lot of musicians that are trying to uh, do a career or build a career in music. As and uh, I, I had the opportunity to meet him a couple of times because he teaches at William Patterson, and you know uh, we we cross paths, uh, you know, through the halls of. Uh, the practice room so <laughs> i'm i'm very happy to have him um all right so uh how are you uh mr jeremy pell let me just unmute you if you could just unmute yourself there on zoom there you go all right hey sir how are you thanks so much for for coming on uh, on the show and, and giving us a little bit of time from your busy schedule how are you doing happy to be here thanks for having Sorry. me Oops. i'm doing great Sorry, Siri's like <laughs> trying to Siri, take over. Siri loves me. <laughs> <laughs> Siri's trying to make the interview. Um, how are you yeah. doing? How's your family? Everybody okay? Everybody's fine, man. You know, uh, we're f- f- figuring out a way to be resilient through all of this. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's the best we could do. That's right. Uh, you are, where are you staying? Where are you, where are you staying right now? I live in Harlem. Harlem. Oh, awesome. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, was just there over there like a couple of weeks ago and uh, doing this live stream secret show from the museum. Have you ever been to the museum before? Uh, once or twice, okay, yes. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, beautiful place. So, uh, um, y- you know, as I was talking to you earlier, you know, uh, I-, I think we had a brief uh, chance to, uh, it, to, uh, to I think, uh, to introduce myself uh, when you when you initially started teaching at at William Patterson. You're still teaching at William Patterson, right? I am. We just finished our semester. Okay. Um, man, how is the, um, how are things uh, uh, have changed for you as an educator, uh, you know, and, and being part of this uh, institution like William Patterson? I wonder, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of us uh, that, uh, that went to school and now maybe haven't, you know, have been out for a while, uh, trying to figure out how are you guys dealing with this, uh, you know, continue the education and dealing with technology and all that. Well, you know, what's interesting about it is that the, uh, there was a certain portion of, you know, I, what I basically do is I teach trumpet mm-hmm. lessons and I also have an ensemble. And so ever since I've started, I've, I've been there since 2016 there's been gaps of time within a semester where I've been on the road. Mm -hmm. And so I've told my students that we had to do Skype lessons. So remote learning in that regard is nothing new. So it wasn't like this, it wasn't like this, like, oh man, now we have to switch because that's how all, that's how oftentimes was um, during just a regular semester pre COVID, 
you know, if I was on, if I was in Europe for like, you know, three weeks and I was like, all right, we have to do this. <laughs> and, you know, that's what it's going to be. Um, ensemble wise, I mean, I know that a few of the, a few of the teachers that are up in age um, did things um, remotely. Mm -hmm. I tried on one or two occasions um, when I couldn't get uh, to the school to the campus to do things um, where I had the, the students bring in their computer and I was zooming in. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely not fun at all. <laughs> for, but for the most, I'll tell you the truth. I mean, my ensemble room was big enough to where we could all be in there and be distanced. Oh, okay. So I ended up going in Oh, that's, that's quite crazy. a bit during the semester. So I mean, I, I mean, I would say eighty percent of uh, the semester, I was there. Oh, I see. Okay, cool. So, so most of the students were actually attending school. Like it was. It oh, was they, like, yeah, they were oh, there. Okay, cool. That's yeah. That's very interesting. Um, that's very awesome that that you transition, like you said, since you had situations where you were on the road and you were teaching them. Uh, via uh, Skype, I guess, right? Because be yeah, before Skype. Zoom was the thing. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know what Zoom was. You know, I had to learn like everybody else. I know that's yeah. crazy, uh, Mr. Pelt. Uh, tell us a little bit about you. You uh, originally from LA, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, your beginnings and your transition to to New York? Uh, and you know, I'm sure in relationship to to uh, building a career as a jazz musician? Uh, well, uh, I was pretty much like any other anxious teenager in high school that, that discovered the music and decided to pursue it. Um, I'm sure you were the same way when you were a teenager. Um, I graduated and went to Berkeley. Mm. Virtually all of my family is back in New York, oh, okay. so it was it you know it was written in the stars that I would be in I would wind up in New York. Mm. Um, so after I graduated, I just moved to the city, and it was it was one of those it, it's it's that was nineteen ninety eight August of nineteen ninety eight and. In that, I caught the tail end of a lot of things that were happening that were still kind of an old school way of development mm -hmm. versus now, you know, when I had to, you know, talk to so many students that are, you know, 20 years old mm -hmm. and wondering how they're going to start working, which That's is scary. a lot scarier than, you know, especially with COVID than it was when I first moved to town. Um, but, you know, I moved to town. I got a day job. Mm. And, but I started hitting the pavement, man. Yeah. You know, I went to every session, and um, and made myself known. That's right. Um, you so you went to all the way up to high school. You were in uh, in California. Did you, do you have? Uh, would you say that you your musical roots started there? And do you remember any of your mentors in L.A. And what? Uh, mm, why is what is it what is it that that made you I mean it's it's kind of a an obvious question because we know that jazz is you know is the mecca is here in New York but I wonder what what was your uh, did you ever consider like building a career like this but in the West Coast or no you know at that time and you know I don't know how many of your viewers are from LA or whatnot <laughs> but you know at that time LA was did it, it you know now well in the last couple of years i'd say maybe the last 10 years maybe it, la has kind of gone through this um this this resurgence of of live music mm. and jazz in particular and that's great for the scene but back then we're talking about the late 80s early 90s unless you were bringing it in from out of town mm. even though a lot of the cats were living there cedar was there Freddie was there, Herbie's still mm -hmm. there. Everybody was there, but everybody's on the road, you know what I mean? So right. that that those were special situations, whereas there wasn't much, and, it, and because it's so spread out, mm. 
I mean, you know, because I, 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 I hesitate to say that there wasn't much going on. I mean, imagine, first of all, I'm a teenager, so where could I really go without my mother? That's right. You know, and I didn't have a driver's license. That's either. right. So I'm sure, I mean, if you talk to somebody of age, if somebody's like a decade older than me and they're like, oh, well, such and such was happening, that they, they might have a different story. But as far as I was concerned, um, yeah, I mean the scene. Nobody really talked about the LA scene that much, so it wasn't. I, it wasn't definitely in in, in my thought that I was going to stay here. Mm. Say, be, be, and, you know, I also grew up in New York too. Mm. You I know, see. earlier years. So I mean, I I wasn't really feeling like I was LA was going to be home. It was just where I happened to live. Yeah. Okay. I see. That's that's very interesting. But when you say when you mention you know, mentors, I, I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't, I mean, because my interest started in L.A. and it developed mm-hmm. in L.A., so I can't, you know, I can't knock the the teachers that I did have, one of which is no longer with us. His name is uh, uh, John Magruder. He was my high school teacher that got me into jazz, mm-hmm. um, fully into jazz, because my mother always played it, but he was the one that I'd come to with many questions and he'd answer all of them. Um, Buddy Collette, who's a multi readist and, and very important on the scene in the fifties and sixties, was also somebody that, you know, was was available to me at the time. Mm. Um, but more so was you know, my my high school teacher. Mm. That's very yeah, man, that's a, that's a very interesting to to hear that, you know, you, you like I mentioned before, you know, you're such a strong musician and and your your you know your music you have up to um, how how many albums up to ten albums right that you that you've been able to record, is that correct? Uh, <laughs> no, I think it's uh seventeen. Oh, seventeen. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, got that. that. Forget that seven right there. One seven. <laughs> yeah. That's that's no amazing. That's uh, I mean just to like you said be, like you mentioned before like the whole thing of of uh, of the era. Like when you moved to New York, I find it very interesting that that uh, that w- when you were able to like you went to Berkeley and you graduated, moved to the city uh, to to find work, and now now that you yourself you're a teacher and you're teaching some of this new generation guys that are they, that I, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you if you're into jazz, if you go to college for jazz, you get accepted. You pretty much really love this music and are into like obviously there's many gaps in in trying to understand this music a lot but it's it's pretty much like i want to do this for a living but then the 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 scene is not the same and 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 the work is probably not there right what do what can you tell us more about uh how you feel about this and the reactions that you've gotten some from some of the students that you teach well, you know, I think it's, it's one of the things that you said that I'll, I'll kind of um, I'll, I'll add my two cents on is that there is an interest, a spark of interest with students that decide to go to more or less a conservatory for jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot happens within those those four years and they decide whether they really can do this mm. so i mean you know somebody in high school that's in the you know whatever the all city high school band or whatnot you know it's a different thing because you're excited and it's still fun and it should always be fun but i mean there's other factors into it and then when you get into college and you you hit with a lot of work you hit what you what you want to be hit with but then all of a sudden it's a lot then you're like oh damn <laughs> so then you're backtracking so i mean i've 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 run into my fair share of students that was just you know had this epiphany this realization that this isn't for them right i see i see that's that yeah i i think i've seen that too i think uh, personally i've had the the opportunity of like just uh, as soon as i started playing at I had to make money. So I think mm-hmm. it was a good thing to realize what the live was, right? And and, and related to what you just mentioned, maybe sometimes uh, students don't realize what, what it is, right? That beyond the music, right? Like, how do we live? Well, yeah. I mean, I've, I've had those conversations. And, you know, here's the thing. Uh, 
you know, I could probably be accused of, of, of being a little bit too real with things, but uh, in, in my teaching style, but a lot of times, you know, I try to cut through all the bullshit mm -hmm. of, 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 uh, of being like, you know, oh, you could do anything you want, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. you, you, cause, cause a lot of times people don't necessarily keep up their end of the bargain in terms of the work process mm -hmm. of what it takes. And it is, and here's, here's the, the interesting thing is it takes a lot of work a lot of work to get out there and then struggle with the rest of us. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and that's the part that you have to reconcile with. And that's the hard part is that you do all this work, you put in all this work, and then you're not getting your just reward right right away. Because then you, you get out and it's a long path. And there's some, and, 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 and then you also perceive that some people, you know, that may be a couple of years ahead of you, or you see, the, the, the spoils that some people are getting and you think oh maybe I can I mean it's inspiring to see but you also perceive that their life as being different mm. um, in, in, a, in a huge way it's like easy street and sometimes it's not things aren't always what they seem yeah man I'm, I'm very interested I'm, I'm always like talking to some of my friends about this topic you know and it's such a such a great opportunity to hear your feedback as somebody that has a strong career um, in the jazz uh, industry and then also you're a teacher and and to see those perspectives uh, before we keep going on this or you know going further with with this I love mm -hmm. to I love to share one of the songs that you that you prepare for us this is uh, love is simple and it's from uh, your latest album is that correct mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. uh, the art of, of in intimacy volume uh, one is that right mm -hmm. And yeah. we have George Cables on it, and mm -hmm. and Peter Washington. Who else is in the album? You just you, you that's named it. it. <laughs> that's there you it. go. There's, so uh, so uh, let's get, get, is is it cool if we just share people with this tune real quick? I would hope oh, that you would. All right, sounds good mm -hmm. then. <laughs> so this is uh, Love Is Simple. Everybody, please, uh, you know, we're sharing on the comments uh, the links where you could get this. This is on. This is on High Note, uh, and uh, this is one of your. Is this one of your compositions? Uh, this, yeah, it's my only original com composition on the record. Beautiful. So hope you guys enjoy. This is uh, Love Is Simple. <laughs>
Yeah, man, that's uh, that's beautiful. Uh, thanks for sharing that uh, that song with with us. That's uh, that's a very interesting sound of just two masters of the music, you know, uh, of piano and, and bass and uh, in, in the sound of the the trumpet. I I, I really love uh, your your sound, and I'm sure you know. Uh, Thank you. It it they, I, yeah, I wasn't really uh, you know. Uh, I was like, uh, I was checking out some of the, some of the tracks, but it's, it's always beautiful to just come in and listen to. To this, tell us a little bit about this composition that that you. you so this is the only composition in the in the album, right? That I wrote, yeah, yeah. Um, well, besides the blues, which was just all improvised, anyhow. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, it was something that that um, I wrote last summer maybe mm -hmm. and it, it was just simply something that I heard in my head but initially when I wrote it it was a little bit overwrought and thankfully I had the um, the, the the wisdom to know <laughs> how to just cut some of the things out because I was going to go into a bar of three and then do this and then do that and I was like man this don't make no sense let me just do this eight bars and that's what it was. Oh, be beautiful, beautiful music, man. Uh, I, like I said, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fan for Thank sure. You. And uh, you know, just to continue with uh, our conversation, especially just to touch on one of the topics uh, that that uh, we're very curious is is you having this this building this touring career as we you know as anybody that knows a little bit about entertainment. Uh, you know, especially nowadays, maintaining a uh, touring career, and then uh, on top of that, being an educator, it's it's not an easy thing for sure. Can you tell us about like how how is it? You you mentioned before about like getting into the scene, really hitting the pavement, and going to jam sessions and meeting people. Uh, can you tell us about that process and how it started to, you know? you know go into like okay now i got my band and now you know obviously this took a lot of work right it did but you know at the time i think one of the important things to point out is that it wasn't a calculated effort in in the sense that you know i said okay i'm going to do this for a year and then i'm gonna stop this and i'm gonna go over here and do this and do, you know what i mean yeah it was the, what I clearly had in my mind when I first moved to town was that I wanted to play with as many uh, cats as mm -hmm. possible. But, you know, the right type of cats. And what do I mean by the right type of cats? I mean the, the cats that, that have status and um, are visible and that have a record to where, you know, I could learn from them. And I did. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so that includes Ralph Peterson, that includes Lewis Nash, that includes Lewis Hayes. Lewis you know, Hayes. then I wanted to start to play, I wanted to play with as many of the old cats that were left, mm -hmm. man. You know, Lewis uh, was gracious enough to, to have me in his band after Vincent Herring introduced mm -hmm. me. Um, you know, I did the Mingus band for a number of years. I recorded with them. I recorded with, you know, 
so it was it was just really kind of indoctrinating myself in the scene and that's what i was really concerned with right there i wasn't when i first you know i've always had a leadership mentality mm -hmm. so th the fact that i was gonna end up there was something that was to me a foregone conclusion mm -hmm. um and it was something that i definitely aspired to do but it wasn't something that i was you know I didn't move here and say I'm going to be a leader right away. Right. And that was that wasn't even in my mind because I knew that the steps that you had to take to get there were that you had to be an apprentice. Right. And which I had no problem. I I loved it. Mm. I loved being a side man. You know, and being in all these different groups. I was in no rush <laughs> to, to 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 do the leader thing yet, even though I knew it was coming and I knew that's what I wanted to do. But it wasn't something that I was like, okay, you know. I'm only going to do this side man thing for, you know, this long and then I'm going to go for it. You know, I wanted to soak up as much knowledge as I could. Mm, right. So, yeah, I, I really like the, the way that you put it of like you were in no rush to like skip any of this stuff that you that you could learn right as a side man. I, I, I find it, you know, very, very, very helpful uh, advice, you know, and sometimes I feel like, uh, you know, Personally, maybe some some of the people in my generation is, is it might be a little bit like, you know, kind of blurry. Like, what it, what are we supposed to do? Am I supposed to just put a band together now and just, you know? But it's it's very it's very valuable to hear advice like that. Yeah. That it's like, hey, we'll just go out and support and try to play with your with your you know with the with the people that I've been doing this for a long time. That and 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 you know, I should say this, you know. The paradigm for all that has changed a lot, and this is what I mean by that. There used to be a time it, it existed, um, maybe even as 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 late as 15 years ago, where I would get asked the questions like you just asked me, but even more so like, well, how do I, you know, what do I do when I move to New York? And your answer would be, well, you got to learn, you know, you should learn some songs. And then you should, you know, play with this. And there were people that were still around that would take you into their groups. Mm. Now what's happened, and you know, I, 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 I think, you know, I, I try to think about it in terms of what if I'm this 22-year-old or 21-year-old kid that's just moving to New York now, and forget about the pandemic. Just, just say, right. just moving to New York now. Mm -hmm and you're trying to start a career in which there are no you know real real senior cats that are left for right. you to play with like there was in the 80s when the, that generation when Winton and Terrence and all these people were brand new you know that doesn't exist anymore it barely existed when I moved to town and so I got the last of that but now it definitely doesn't so I think that the position that somebody in my generation is in um somebody certainly you know uh before he died god bless him roy hargrove was in that generation where he was now taking on, on young talent um and so that's a mantle that you know i take out take over um and so many of my people in my generation take over because we have we're embedded with this knowledge that we did get from the people that sadly a 21 year old is not going to be able to have because the person is dead that's right. you know what i mean yeah so or even if they're not dead they just you it's hard to contact so now i have that knowledge so really the way i see it quite frankly is the young cats need to be coming up to us to to get that knowledge to get that and knowledge. And, and and so when you move to town and you finish your program or whatnot, you know, you should move into town with that that kind of uh, determination. Like, let me see if I can play in this group and play in this group. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, even, you know, it makes me think, you know, even when I was talking to people like Carl Allen, mm. you know, Carl Allen, you know, they moved to town. They wanted to play with Freddie Hubbard and what he saw, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you think about the spread. Carl Allen... I'm, I'm using him because I remember his discussion with him. 
that I had with him. Carlisle was born in 1961, 62, around there. Mm-hmm. He's not, so he's about 20 years younger than a Freddie or 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 a Woody, mm-hmm. right? So, you, and so he moved to town wanting to play that music with them, you know. Now, obviously, it, it, I'm not putting myself like I'm Freddie and Woody, but what I'm saying is that now we're in that position now to where another 20 year old is moving to town, and I'm 20 years right. older, plus years older than that. So. And me and, and and many other people in the gener- in my generation and in, in the generation above are now in that position to where we're left to hold and 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 hold the the the, uh, the mantle and 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 have people join us so that we can go ahead and inculcate and and educate the 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 scores of musicians that are coming up. Mm-hmm. But when I think about young musicians coming up, you know. I, I don't blame them for wanting to have something, to, you know, start their own thing because the opportunities are not as vast as, vast. as they were. That's true. That it's a, that's the reality. But, you know, I, I really love the way that you really bring out this, this very uh, essence of this music of like, you know, if you really want to b- learn this music. Yeah. Um, nowadays we have schools where you could go get your degree but like you're talking about you're referring to this part of your career of like really having the opportunity to learn a lot by playing with people that have been doing it that unfortunately you you don't get that in college degree right like mm-hmm. and, yeah. and, and uh and and if think about i mean you think about other genres of music and it, it that's also like a, such a beautiful thank you if, if you want to say of, of of this this hey let me pass this on and the only way to do that is and then having i guess now that you you're mentioning you yourself as well I, i'm here well you know this is what i've learned and i've had the opportunity to play and learn from other um jazz heroes now i can call some other people younger people into my band and and and, and I've, i've if uh can you tell us about that because you've done that you you actually have uh, a band with younger musicians right um is that was was it can you explain to us was it merely my decisions i really want to pass on this i'm gonna go out and find out some young musicians i'm sure it's also mixed things right like just fall in love with somebody's playing and stuff like that, right? Right. Well, you know, I think that... So the first band that I... Well, not the, the first, but like, let's say the, the the most substantial band, the first substantial band, I'll say, that I had was a band... Um, my, my first Jeremy Pell quintet. And that had J.D. Allen. And that had Danny Grissett. And that had Dwayne Burno, who's no longer with us, mm-hmm. and that had Gerald Cleaver. Now, the one thing that that band had <laughs> was that everybody in that band was older than me, you know? Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, we had a, a great mutual respect, and we had great times on the road. And, I, and it, you know, one of the things that kind of irks me is that it didn't um, get as as much press as I w- wish that we would have. We put out four records mm-hmm. um, in succession. Uh, but it was a hell of a band, and we did do quite a bit of touring. Now, after that band, but e- even even during that band, I had another kind of electric thing that was brewing under that. And I did have younger cats, but I, I didn't necessarily, um, like, farm them, like, go out, like, no, I need, I need somebody young. Where's, where are the young people at? You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Okay. But they were just there mm-hmm. i mean i had a band even before the quintet called creation and that was like a cult kind of underground hit in new york like around 2000 mm-hmm. you know and that band had a very young tommy crane mm-hmm. warren wolf before he got warren all wolf. you know <laughs> you know turned into mr atlas <laughs> yeah, and um right. you know i mean warren's always been a bad cat and um 
Did you and, and did you my, meet him? Because he also went to Berkeley, right? But he did. He was. He came. To, he. I was in my last year. He. My last year was his first year at Berkeley. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but uh, so I had that band, and that was a very special band, and had a different kind of sound to it. Um, and it, it was a mixture of cats that were older. Myron was in that band. Myron Walden. Um, Myron Walden. And you know, Walt and. Mike Marino. Mike Marino. He's younger. Wow. Yeah, Mike is younger. Tommy's younger. Derek Nevergelt. We went to school together. He's a bass player. He's a year older than me. Um, you know, so that was the band um, mm-hmm. that I had. So it was a mix. So I, I, I never really set out to be like, okay, I want this band to just be full of Young cats, cats right. that are younger right, than me. Right. But it just happens that way, you know. And and the more people that reach out that I that that I hear that I feel like could add something to it, you know, I mean sooner or later, here's here's another thing. Here's 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 where it's really at. <laughs> sooner or later you're you're gonna be the oldest person in sooner the band. Sooner or later, right. Yeah. I spent twenty years and I still occasionally will be the youngest person on the bandstand, mm-hmm. but I spent a long time being the youngest person right. on the bandstand. You that's know right. what I mean? And that's, I mean, this is not a complaint. It's neither here nor there. It's just what it is. So now when I get cats, you know, that, that, that are interested in playing with me and I'm interested in having, it's just a coincidence mm-hmm. that they're all younger than me. Mm, that's very, very <laughs> you know very, what I mean? Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, uh, it, it, it reminds me of uh, uh, the the late uh, Mr. Wallace Rooney uh, with his band that mm-hmm. that sadly we lost recently. Such an amazing uh, person. I got to meet him a couple times, and his music so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And, but like very young music band. It's a it's a, I, I I bet it was a blessing for them to just like you know play with oh absolutely <laughs> and tour absolutely. and stuff. Hey, uh, right. before we continue, I'd like to show them another tune of uh, that you prepare for us. This is from uh, this is uh, Rod- Rodin Sweet and mm-hmm. uh, Rodin Rodin yeah. Rodin, and this is uh, uh, from uh, your album. It's just uh, the artist, right? Is that what it's? So yeah, the 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 Jeremy name of that Pelt. record is Jeremy Pelt, the artist, artist yeah. and. Um, on that record, there was a suite that I wrote. I was commissioned to write by Font, um, the Festival of New Trumpet Music Organization. And um, it was, uh, I chose as the subject of the suite, um, the sculptures of the French sculpturist, uh, August Rodin. August Rodin, okay, that's where it's coming from. So mm-hmm. what we can li- we're listening to the first movement of, uh, of the suite. Is that correct? Okay, so that was the first thing that you played before oh, I came on here. That's though. right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, yes. Uh, I have it as uh, part one. Yes, this is uh, yeah. Rodin Suite Part One. Um, mm-hmm. So, hope you guys enjoy it. Like I mentioned, you know, go. We we're sharing your contact information. We're sharing your your website. Uh, go out there and buy this uh, uh, this music. There, buy the new album. Uh, you know, really get to know this music. That's why we presented this music to you guys. Uh, make sure to get in touch with Mr. Mr. Jeremy Pelt. If maybe one day you want to play with them, you know, you got to pay your dues for sure, you know. <laughs> all, all musicians out there. So this right. is uh, Rodin Suite. Uh, this is the first move- movement. I hope you guys enjoy it.
there checking it out. Um, we have uh, uh, Mr. Jeremy Pelt tonight here for the ones tuning in now. Uh, we just listened to one of the tracks in, uh, off of his album, Jeremy Pell, the artist. Um, can you tell us, uh, Mr. Pell, about the the, the people in this uh, in this album? Oh, I have to. Yeah, sorry. There you go. So now you, there you go. Yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot to. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, certainly I can do that. Uh, on the vibraphone, we have an up and coming star. Her name is Chain Chain Lu. She's from Taiwan. All right. Uh, Victor Gould is on the piano. Ooh. Victor Gould. Vicente Archer is on the bass. Nice. My longtime friend and colleague. We were in school together. Um, that's Alan Mednard on drums. Mm. Uh, percussionist Ismail Wignall. And then that's Alex Wentz on guitar mm. and Frank Locrasto, who's been with me since 2001, plays some Fender Rhodes mm. on it as well. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that, yes, beautiful sound, uh, definitely a contrasting sound and, and band and, you know, it's, it, it, and, and, you know, the, the, the writing and everything, right? So I, that's one of the things that I like as soon as I was, I, I listened to your music. Uh, especially this particular track, so I was like, "Wow, that's the range is, you know, it, it, on your writing and and you you know really just picking your projects and everything. That's very amazing." Hey, I I like to give some shout outs to some uh, some uh, killing trumpet players that are listening to this interview. Uh, Mr. Jason Palmer is listening to to this, and he's actually uh, <laughs> he's got a couple of questions for you. Um, so uh, might as well I'll just read him, you know. It's a little bit long, but Jason, how you doing, Jason? <laughs> I hope he's that's my buddy. Yeah, I hope we can have him one of these days over here. Love to pick. I'm his sure brain. you can. I'm yeah. sure he loves it. I've I've known Jason since uh, uh, for a long time. Yeah, he's uh he 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 wants to know this. He says, could you go further into the idea that eventually you'll be the oldest person in the band? What causes that to happen? Is it a particular writing style? Uh, the style of writing leaning itself to a particular openness of mind that is related to age or something else. I don't. I, I mean, it's not that deep. <laughs> it's just that you. you I, well, okay. Okay. Look at it like this. If there's any depth to that statement, it's that you tend to. The reason why a lot of people tend, a lot of older band leaders tend to get younger cats is simply the the availability and the eagerness to grow and to mm. learn and grow right so for instance i could say all right i'm going to put together this band let's say we're going to do that rodan suite and i say all right so here's here's going to be the band it's going to be um stefan harris and and then i'm gonna get um uh you know brad meldow on piano Mm. And then I'm going to get, uh, you know, let me see if I can get, you know, maybe Chick Corea to do something on some on Fender Roads. <laughs> and then I'm going to get, you know, Chris McBride. On, you know, so all great musicians and all people that have played together and all people that will make the, 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 the project sound great. But first of all, you're not going to get them mm -hmm. on, a, on, a, on the road. That's right. You you could probably if I had all types of money, and you know a, a great planning way ahead of time, yeah, I can get them in the studio. But that's not. And let's say that they were at your disposal anyhow, cats of that caliber, on just a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. um, they have so many different projects that they're doing, and they're band leaders, and in, in their own right, that they're not going to possibly be able to funnel all their energy into this project mm. that is very special to me you know and that's and that's and that's just life so it's, life. this is not me this is not me blaming them and or blaming anybody that's of that age and being like well this person's just not gonna do it it's just life if if you got other things and the same thing could be said for me you know what i mean if somebody's saying yeah i want to do this project and have, have pelts on it but for uh, uh, an extended amount of time, it's probably not going to happen because I've got 10 million things that I want to do. That's right. You know, but if I'm putting together a band of people that, you know, are on the scene that are eager to work, normally in that case, they're going to be younger cats. 
you know, I mean, look, Chain Chain ain't had this. This was her first record, wow. and subsequently, I took her on her first trip to Europe. On her first trip, L- yeah. oh, last year, last year was her first, uh, like a bunch of firsts. The record <laughs> came out. She not only did she go to Europe, she went to Europe twice in a year. Nice. She, she, you know, we went to Japan. I mean, she'd been to Japan before. But I mean, we did two European tours. We did, we did a tour of Japan. We did tours all up and down the Midwest, all up, and, you know, that she'd never been to. So I mean, this is something, you know, and and Alan the same way, uh, you know. I mean, he'd been to Europe before, but I mean, you know, just getting them busier, at, with the aspect of touring, mm-hmm. because see, that's a lost thing too. And when I'm talking that's about right. touring, it's not, it's not, you know, we're gonna go here for a week. My tours you know, pre-COVID were, you know, three-week affairs. Mm -hmm. And it was boom, boom, boom. We're going to go to this town because that's what I'm used to. You know what I mean? So, you know, that's what I mean. So when you're faced with that, yeah, your your pull gets to be a little bit younger. Mm, Right. (laughs) And so that's what I mean. So that's the only thing I mean by I'm the youngest, I'm the oldest person in the band. Well, that's the uh, that's I think that's a pretty thorough answer for sure. Uh, we had uh, another Taiwanese American that uh, actually he's Taiwanese American that asked the question, Mister Peter Lin. He said, uh, oh, Peter, "What yeah. uh, what was one of your first gigs in New York City when when you when you moved over here?" My first gig in New York, I I I. Well, let me see. I'm trying to think if he means on a on a high visibility level or just first gig period. My first gig period might have been at Cleopatra's Needle. Cleopatra's Needle. Yeah, and that's when you know. I remember when I first moved to New York, and we all went down. That was me, uh, alto player named Julius Tolentino. We used to live together. Oh, Julius. And a, and a tr- nice. and a trombone player named Danny Kirkham. We lived together. Julius had the car. <laughs> and we would drive, and we would drive to um, to Cleopatra's Needle, mm. and that's where we saw Philip Harper, and he was leading the session. Also, another trumpet player named Manny Duran was leading the session, and so we would go on those nights and sit in. And once they, you know, heard me, you know, Philip would be like, "Hey, man, you know, I got to go on the road. Can you sub for me doing this? Get you know, running the session." So that's what it was. Mm. On a, 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 in terms of, um on a higher visibility i tell you the truth when i for the, the first gig that took me on the road when i first moved to town was a ska band ska. called the scatolites ska. and it, not only was it a ska band it was the the king of ska bands because they were the ones that started ska wow so it was a scatolites and then um then there was also the mingus band that was like the first high profile jazz gig i got mm, man well there's your answer mr lynn <laughs> but um mm-hmm. Uh, man, uh, it's uh, it, it's it's really amazing to to be able to like talk to somebody like you and really just I think it's very generous of you to just to share some of this insight on how to how how things uh, happen for you and and what you advise to new generations. Uh, you know, as related to what we what you were mentioning of like younger cats and all that. Uh, since uh, since uh, the reality is that. There's uh, a lot of us that are trying to build a career. Uh, do you have uh, um, an, an, some kind of? Uh, do you have advice for for musicians in in terms of like doing this? In terms of like, you know, okay, I'm 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 playing with with people, and I live in the area. I make the commitment. I got a daytime job, but I want to transition into into eventually playing more with more people or like even just having a band and touring uh what would would you be your advice for for them those are those are you know lots of different uh levels of uh, tiers of advice um <laughs> right. i i'll say this i'd say that the one thing that you want to be is is um you want to walk around with a positive vibe and an eagerness, but not over eager. Mm. You know, not, don't be too eager. You know, you still got to be cool. Mm. 
but you don't want to be, you know, up in somebody's face all the time. Sure. So it's 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 a, it's a thin line because you know, you you need to be on the scene. Mm -hmm. And the more you're seen and then especially the more you're heard, then the more you you you're in the consideration. Mm -hmm. I know some people that just stay at home. And I'm like, well, you, you know, how do you think you work just because people even if they can play you got to be out there playing right. and 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 being on the scene as much as possible and having a positive uh uh attitude mm. and 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 doing all the things that we've all heard showing up on time you know being being dressed apart looked apart you know mm. and then when you when you eventually get that ball rolling the next thing is uh, you know, for me, because and I'm, I'm, I've thought about holding a seminar, and I still might mm, do it oh, at some cool. a, a point about uh, about the business. But I, I would say that younger cats and older cats, because I do know quite a few older <laughs> cats that don't know the business too. So it's not just something that's exclusive to younger cats, but they all need to learn the business of of music, and as as it pertains to you know, mm. releasing records as it pertains to touring, um, as it pertains to the difference between a manager and a, and a, and a touring and, and, and a booking agent, all these things. Um, one of the things that I did when I was on the road, as a sideman, of course, was I always was the quiet one that was looking around to see who the promoter was. Mm. Right, and then I would get their information. Right, and I so I just have a stack of cards from different promoters that would that was that was contracting the Mingus band, or they were contracting Lonnie Plasco's band or Ralph's band, you know. And I would just get their information and stay in touch, just at at a at a at a at a uh, distance. So I'm not, you know, I wasn't necessarily sending them like a weekly gazette of things that I was fucking doing. I was, it was just, you know, every once in a while I would, if I had a record coming out, mm. then I would, I would send, send that, engage interest in terms of, of touring because touring is a whole other monster, especially if you're trying to tour overseas. overseas. Um, and so there's a lot of things that you, you, you're going to want to know about that. But one of the things is I highly recommend and it's, you know, it's kind of like the old Gershwin song goes, nice work if you can get it, mm -hmm. is, you know, really start touring with other people. And and when you're with other people, you know, don't be such a, a nuisance in terms of trying to be up in everybody's business about business, mm -hmm. you know, but just be around absorb, and get right. that information, you know, and, and just absorb it and see how different things work because touring is an eye, an eye opening experience mm. and the more you do it the more you see what works and what doesn't work and how things you know fall into place mm. in, in terms of putting the tour together and just have patience for it you know and 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 and, and be have patience and also be very uh, focused on what you're doing and you'll no doubt after a while learn how to be a band leader I mean for me it took a long time mm -hmm. and it's something that I'm most proud of because not everybody can do it the way that I do right. it which is everything myself that's, you know what I mean that's amazing yeah. um, and that goes down from driving sometimes booking all the flights booking all the transportation I do all that wow. you know what I mean that's, yeah. but that's something that's learned over a period of time man I, I think you really touched on that that really interesting part of uh, this industry right that I, I feel personally that that uh, a lot of us lack you know like the knowledge of the business side and and on that note uh, uh, Mr. Palmer is also asking a very interesting question Ruth Regarding that, he was saying, uh, uh, could you please talk about the delicate balance of recording for a label? Man, he's making my work easy. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's really answering the right questions right now. Yeah. He's like, could you please talk about the delicate balance of recording for a label and the importance of, of owning your masters? 
He says, do you own as many of the masters of your work that you would like to at this point? Or do you have deals that you're happy with? You know, I, I have a different way of thinking about things, you know. Um, so first of all, I'll give you the short answer. The short answer is no, I don't um, own any of my masters. Mm. Um, when you get into it, you know, you know what's interesting is that just a few hours ago, I was watching that Dave Chappelle uh, thing that he did on on uh, ins well, he did a show and it's on his Instagram about um, his contract with Comedy Central oh. and how he basically told the audience don't watch it because they didn't pay him. It. But oh, wow. you know the thing the thing is this you know it's I'm a very logical person. And that's something that speaks to me, the logic of things, mm -hmm. right? Um, you look at your contract and you decide how much you're willing to give, right? Now, it is an important thing if you, may, if you want it to be an important thing to own your masters, you know what I mean? I, I, I definitely understand that and there will be a point in my career, advancing years, where I, I might f find it more beneficial to do that. Mm -hmm. um, certainly when you're starting out, and I'm not talking directly to Jason because Jason's right. got record, he's got many records, but when you're starting out as, as a recording artist, um, you're not in a position to really be dictating terms on on a level of I want to own my masters right. bargain or whatever you don't you know and this is the same this is and this is the same kind of pitfall that that happened to Dave Chappelle mm -hmm. you know what I mean he's where but yeah he's young he's expecting his first child mm -hmm. and it's like okay look just show me the money and that's, right. that's what and that's also something that happened to Prince mm -hmm. you know what I mean because you. But now, in those situations, which are completely different from mine, you know, you re you had to read that small print to where they basically say they own every part of you. Because one of the things that Dave Chappelle said in that special was that, you know what, I'm thinking about doing another Dave Chappelle show. Oh, wait a minute, I can't, because Comedy Central basically owns wow. that title in perpetuity. Jeez. You know, and so that is, you know, he's still making his millions. Netflix right. paid him, but you can't purposely go out there and say this is the new Dave Chappelle show. You can't do You'd it. You have to engage with them reason. again into doing it through them. And, which is, and, and at that point, it's not going to happen. Same thing with Prince. He also said the reason why Prince called himself the artist was because, he, he, first of all, once he split with, I think it was Warner or whoever, whatever label that was. Mm -hmm. He could no longer be Prince without paying them money. You know what I mean? So now he would say, okay, I'm going to be the artist, which was his, 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 his own sense of humor, because in the contract, you're called the, the artist, artist right? you know? So it's, it's something, you know, getting back to Jason's question, it's something about reading the fine print of the contract and being okay with giving a certain amount of, of, of yourself away to, to gain something. Because see, here's the thing. People, even in this era of, 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 of digi digitizing everything, people, a lot of people, as entertainers, are under the impression that you can get everything that you want without giving something. Right. And I don't know an entertainer to this day, no matter how outspoken they were, everybody from Miles Davis to Prince, whoever you are, nobody has ever gotten <laughs> put out a record or put out a movie without, or whatever without giving a piece of their intellectual property. Right. It, you know, yeah. and that, and that's and that's the, that's the price that you pay, and the only and the thing that that and I mean, look at you know, look at Taylor Swift. Right. <laughs> That's she, true. She's got. She's thinking about redoing her whole catalog, of because her first six records have just sold from Scooter Braun. Scooter Braun basically owned six of her records and sold those six records for three hundred million dollars. 
to somebody else. And she still can't get, she can't even buy it from these people because Scooter put in his contract, if she's going to buy it, she can't say anything bad about him. Wow. <laughs> so she, so she, in her mind, she's like, well, maybe I'll go ahead and re-record these records and put a different spin. Oh. You know, it's, it's a tireless pursuit. And this is something that we all fall prey to. So the, the thing to understand is that you're, you're going to give up some kind of an equity mm -hmm. yeah. as an artist. The, 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 the idea is to leave with as much of your shirt on as possible. Because as long as you're living and you're cre being creative, you could always create something new. Mm -hmm. That's true. You see what I'm saying? And that's the way that I think. Um, and I know that there's artists that will agree with that. There's artists that don't agree with it. All I'm saying is what I, the way that I see it, you know. Right. Um, no, I, no, I don't own my masters. But there's, as long as I'm creative, there's an opportunity for me to get to a point to where I'm comfortable releasing something on my own accord, which is coming soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because now anybody can release anything on any platform. Right. You know what I mean? For good, so, for good or for bad. So, <laughs> for, for good or for bad. <laughs> this is very true. But, you know, that's the thing. You know, the record companies are here to finance it. And that's where you you, you, you kind of get caught up in, in things. Is because, you know, I don't necessarily have the capital to go out there and say, okay, I'm going to spend all this money. And that way I can just basically own it and I can pay you independently of, of somebody else funding it. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I, so I said, all right, okay, no problem. You want to go ahead, you know, High Note owns the, 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 uh, the, masters. the masters of the Rodan suite. Okay. I still, but now the, the important thing is this. They own that master. I could still go and record the Rodan suite again and release it myself. Right. It's different master. solos and it'll still be mine. Yeah. And they don't own the publishing. I own all the publishing. So the most important thing is that you retain your publishing. Don't give your publishing away. Yeah, that's true. That's that's the most important thing. The masters, you know, I'm not going to sit over here and fight about that. <laughs> Man, I feel like we got to, you know, we got to collect some signatures to get you to teach a business class of william patterson or something you know <laughs> yeah. man i'll i'll sign up i'll go back to school you know because i mean just to have the you know just to see the value on, on really getting the insight from somebody that's doing it that's touring that you know the ins and out i mean man that's that's amazing uh, man i like to show uh, i like to show the 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 last song that you have for us before we wrap it up because i know we you know we could talk here all night i'd love to to pick your brain all 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 night for sure but uh just so that people get to get uh more acquainted with your with your album um we would like to show the next tune which is uh while you are gone and it's back to that amazing uh uh band of mr george cable and and peter washington so mm -hmm. let's check it out and then and then you know we can we can uh uh, exchange a couple of thoughts on the on the tune and and uh, go from there. Okay, all right. So here okay. here it goes. This is uh, while you were gone, um, off of the the latest album of Mr. Jeremy Pelt, The Art of Intimacy, Volume One, uh, featuring Mr. George Cables and Peter Washington. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs>
Wow, Mr. Jeremy Pilt, uh on trumpet there uh, off of his uh, latest album of The Art of Intimacy, Volume 1. Um, uh, sir, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, Mr. Pelt, to have you on the show, to uh, exchange with you some ideas and, uh, um, you know, even just having Mr. Uh, Jason Palmer asking some of these questions and to all the listeners we really really want to thank you for listening every week you know uh, we get I know we get a lot of people to check out this uh, interviews uh, that maybe wish they could be on the live but you know that's that's one of the cool things about the live you get to to ask a question your questions will be asked most likely and uh yeah, want to thank you for this uh, for this time. Um, what is uh, what is on the horizon for for Mr. Jeremy Pelt and, and your band and your projects? Uh, well, number one, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Um, number two, the my next release will be coming out uh, in the beginning part of 2021. Mm. Um, the name of it is Grio. This is very important. Uh -huh. And just to uh, explain what it is, I'm also working on a book that is um, re uh, somewhat akin to Art Taylor's Notes and Tones. It's a, it's a bunch of musician to musician interviews. Um, mm, that's cool. Just about you know the parallels um, because it. Uh, I've interviewed several generations of musicians. Yeah. And so I've got over about 35 hours of interviews wow. from 35 different cats. And I've decided to take about five or six of those sound bites from the interviews and write music to them. Oh, wow. So that's what you're going to be hearing on um, the, the, the new album. next CD, the new album that's coming out. Um, so I'm excited for that. And uh, really cool. and the band is the same band that is from Jeremy Pelt, the artist. Oh, cool. Um, we recorded it uh, live at uh, Rudy Van Gelder's studio, um, much just like we recorded uh, Art of Intimacy at, at Rudy Van Gelder's. Oh, nice. Um, I've got I've got an extensive history with Rudy Van Gelder's studio, nice. going back to when I did Men of Honor, Honor. Um, and Talented Mr. Pelt, when actually Rudy engineered it himself. Oh wow! Um, that's but awesome. so yes, that that's that's the um, that's on the horizon, and, and you know, forging ahead. Right. It, it, nobody knows what we, we, we're going to be. Um, next year in terms of uh the viability of of, of touring mm -hmm. um i i am making plans yeah um just because that's how my mind always works in terms of thinking you know six months to a year in advance and so with that said we are planning uh to to be overseas in 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 spring in april and may um with the quintet so that's that's pretty much what's going that's, on that's very very awesome uh and uh you know can can uh, people pre-order some of this stuff or not just yet it's it's not available not for pre-order okay. not yet I, I i surmise that it would likely be available if any time probably during the uh towards the the, the end of december if not the you know the very first weeks of uh, January that's cool yeah yeah uh, some people are saying already that note uh, notes and tones is like a some one of their favorite collection of interviews so I mean it's <laughs> it's it's it's, it's, it's I, I would hope that it's every uh, musician's favorite I mean and this is this is kind of like a, it, it's definitely sparked the idea and it's definitely a continuation of, of something that our Taylor you know had the 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 foresight to do yeah well uh mr pelt like i said you know it's been it's been an honor to talk to you to uh, ask you s several questions and really to share uh a little bit of time with you um thank you uh for spending man over uh, an hour and a half of just re really just talking to us and answering some of our questions 
Um, we want to wish you and your family a happy Thanksgiving, a safe one. You know, we we want to wish everyone that's listening and that check out this uh, live stream afterwards to uh, to stay safe. You know, we're going through uh, rough times. We we just uh, from the Jazz Exchange, from me personally, my wife and Candace. We want to wish uh, all a, a happy Thanksgiving, and uh, you hopefully that we can all stay safe and you know still get in touch with people. Maybe, maybe it's gonna have to be virtually this time. You know, I, I don't know. You know, just uh, make sure to do the the best to to stay safe, and uh, and I hope to see you next week, same time, Wednesday, uh, same place, the Jazz Exchange and YouTube channel and Facebook and. And uh, we'll have a very nice surprise for you all for next week's uh, interview, uh, Mr. Mr. Pellet, Thank you so much. Thanks for having Appreciate me. Appreciate you, Thanks and again. and uh, and hopefully uh, I'll get to listen to the band next year and and get the new album and everything. All right. Absolutely. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Happy man. Thanksgiving. Take care.
Thank you.